My name's Graham Bell. Um, just a few words about Editeur, since it's probably a, an unfamiliar organisation to most of you. It's a very small, uh, unique, member-funded organisation, bringing together experts in metadata, book publishing systems, technology and business. Uh, we aim to serve a, a truly global range of stakeholders from right across the book and academic journal or serials supply chains. Not just our members, the ones who fund us directly, but the whole of the industry. And we do that by delivering identification and metadata standards that make a real difference to the way that the book and serials publishing uh, sectors work. Uh, we try to offer uh, an authoritative uh, centre for getting advice uh, based upon our own knowledge, our own experience and input from our members. Everybody who works for Editor has worked directly in the sector, not solely in the metadata and standards world. We also manage the International ISBN Agency and provide secretariat support for two other standards, the ISTC and ISNI, uh, both uh, more recent than the ISBN. ISTC is a work identifier and ISNI is an identifier for parties or public identities. And in fact, photographers could themselves have ISNIs uh, should they register for them. Given that we manage the ISBN agency internationally, what that means is we may well be managing the most successful persistent identifier scheme that there is. Editor has a growing membership, about 100 members all around the world, 20 or so countries represented it, and most importantly, our members represent the whole of the supply chain, from publishers right through to retailers. With new members uh, in Egypt, in Japan, in China, as well as established members from Europe and North America. There were a few uh, themes brought out from this morning that were actually part of my second slide here. One of them is the contrast, uh, I was talking about this to somebody over lunch, between machine readable and machine actionable rights information. Something like a link to a licensed text is in some way machine readable, but there's no way it can be actioned. Machine actionable license data can drive functions within a delivery platform that can be used to perhaps enforce license terms at the point of use or provide more information. Machine actionable rights expressions need a very strong identification of the resources of the parties who are, are um, subject to rights agreements and to the rights themselves. To be machine actionable, you need unambiguous semantics concerning the nature of the rights that you own or are trying to sell. Semantics, a dictionary, or more specifically, a lexicon of rights terms which are agreed and understood by all parties. Just as an aside, the elimination of ambiguity in those rights terms isn't always in the interests of the parties involved. Commercial rights transactions often require a certain flexibility of definition, a kind of creative ambiguity, I suppose, that can help lubricate the process of negotiation. So there is sometimes some tension between the idea of machine-readable rights and the process of commercial negotiation. Another contrast that was uh, brought out this morning was the difference between uh, in-band license information and the combination of an identifier which is associated with the content and all the license metadata being available elsewhere. It's very different methodologies. Should you aim to carry all the rights, all the information, all the metadata embedded inside the contents itself, or should you somehow describe the rights and all the other metadata completely out of band? Embedded rights are prone to stripping, and of course they're pointless, I think, when rights metadata is as dynamic as is usually the case. And there's no one single answer to any of these issues. There's no one rights message, no one machine-readable expression of rights, because there's no one single use case across a supply chain, whether for books, in editor's case, or for photographs. There are many different use cases and potentially many different sorts of expression of rights. What you need is to ensure that if there are different expressions, then at least they're interoperable. In the books world, editor, uh, I want to highlight three families of message 
which editor defines and which contain at least some information about rights. First of all, Onyx for Books, this is primarily a descriptive metadata XML message. It's huge. There's four or five hundred terms in it, and uh, you can describe everything from the name of the author to, uh, well, you can embed uh, a pricey of the book, you can embed, of course, sales rights information, you can embed the price and where you should order the book from. It is by far editor's most implemented standard. They're used throughout North America, Europe, and uh, in Asia Pacific area as well. Two common versions in use, but they both have a small amount of rights information in them. We also develop a, uh, a message called Onyx for RROs, for Rights Reproduction Organisations. This is uh, a suite of collective licensing messages, mandates and sales reports that flow back and forth between publishers and RROs. And the third one I want to talk about is Onyx for Publication Licenses. Now this is a message that's primarily about the licensing of electronic resources, whether they're online resources or whether that stand alone, or whether they're serials, they're online journals, academic journals. And Onyx for Publication Licenses is primarily used between the publishers of these resources and academic libraries who license them. There's a very complex use case for Onyx for Publication Licenses that has to do with embedding those resources uh, within library virtual learning environments or learning management systems. And the rights information in Onyx for Publication Licenses is very actionable because ultimately it can control what the end user in the library, maybe the student or the academic, can do with the resource. Let's go back first to Onyx for Books. One part of Onyx for Books is about rights. Onyx for Books says nothing or very little about what rights a publisher holds. It's not about the transaction between the author or creator of the work and the publisher. Onyx for Books is primarily about the transaction between the publisher who makes products and the retailer who sells them. And this is a small chunk of Onyx that describes where in the world can the retailer sell this product? And you might think, for example, that that is simply controlled by where in the world is the publisher allowed to exploit the work. The publisher acquires rights from the author. Those rights may be split up territorially. And of course, the publisher can't grant rights to the retailer that the publisher doesn't have. So you would think that the publication rights, the rights held by the publisher, are the same as the sales rights that is, the rights the publisher grants to the retailer. And in fact, they're not always. Uh, this is an expression of where can the retailer sell. In this case, a list of countries, basically the US plus uh, various other US-related territories like the Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico plus Canada. So fairly typical, you are allowed to sell this in North America and uh, some associated countries. But the O4 there is a code that means, in effect, I have exclusive rights in these territories and I am choosing not to use them. This, in fact, is an expression of no rights at all to sell. So the publisher has the right to sell in these territories, but is choosing not to exploit. Moving on to Onyx PL, Onyx for Publication Licenses. This uh, build is a standard that builds on some work done by the Digital Library Federation in their <coughs> Electronic Resource Management Initiative work from the early 2000s. It's joint between NISO and Editeur, part funded by JISC in the UK and the Publishers Licensing Society. It enables publishers or libraries to link particular resources to a particular set of machine processable rights, duties, limitations. To load those um, rights expressions into library management systems and potentially to enforce those rights and duties within the delivery system. It's very specialised to handle licences of e-resources and it's very specialised to library use cases. 
but it does enable the libraries to treat a very disparate range of electronic resources, whether they're integrating resources, continuing resources, or fixed resources, in a highly standardized way. It is a particularly complex XML message, so I'm only going to show you a very high level uh, summary of the sorts of things that uh, it contains, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail at all. Each of these XML uh, terms is really a composite, a placeholder for, uh, in some cases, several tens of individual elements. If you distill it down, I suppose underneath there's uh, a model that views a usage right as a combination of six or seven major elements. A resource at the top to which the right applies, a specific type of usage, a user or class of users that may exercise that right, a set of constraints and duties that apply to either the licensor or the licensee of the usage right, a status for that usage, like has it been exploited already, and possibly a set of usage rights that will apply to any derived resource that arises from the usage. So if one of the usages, for example, is to um, abstract some information from the resource, there may be some rights that apply then to the associated chunk of data, which is the, uh, the bit you abstracted. Note that the user doesn't need to be the licensee. Typically, the licensee is a library, and the users are patrons of that library. The important point is to define the relationship between the licensee and the users. For example, does the set of users include alumni of the institution? Does it include faculty as well as students, or just the faculty? And duties can be things like uh, requirements to ensure that the content is held very securely. A constraint may be about time or place. Can you only use the resource on campus, or does it apply off campus? The way that this is expressed in XML looks a bit like this. This is a very small extract from an Onyx PL expression of the so-called Seru license. Not in fact a license, but a so-called shared electronic resource understanding. It's a NISO recommended practice, intended as a mechanism to uh, effectively as an alternative to a license. It's a broad agreement, an understanding shared between a content provider and an institution that defines its authorised users, the nature of the resource, the appropriate and inappropriate usages. Perhaps it also might talk about requirements for privacy, confidentiality, or the um, delivery of usage statistics. Within Seru, there are expected service level agreements as well, and these are set up as uh, requirements within the licence, and arrangements for archiving and time-limited or perpetual access. The important point here, well, there's two. One is that Seru is very flexible. A single fixed expression of this uh, understanding, licensor replacement, um, requiring only the replacement of the party names and the resource ID, can't really be created. Although editors created an Onyx PL expression, we treat this as a template to be customized on each application of the Seru understanding. That customization matches the typical commercial negotiation between the rights holder and the acquiring institution. Publishers have standard license templates, but they're then, it's not a fixed offer. They're then expected to be customized and negotiated through the process of library acquisition. The metadata needs to reflect that human negotiation part of the process. And as I think it was um, Eugene uh, said this morning, the dynamic nature of the rights metadata through that process and indeed after acquisition. So as well as these expressions, we created a tool called Opal that enables Onyx PL expressions to be edited. And as well as the Seru expression shown here, we've actually completed encodings of a few other licenses as well, including CC Attribution or CC BY 3.0 license and a common library model license, which strangely goes under the name of Lib license. And of course, that Opal tool for editing gives you access to the Onyx Terms Dictionary. Now, this is an important part of the structure because it's only by having a commonly understood lexicon, a set of exhaustive terms that can be used, are things like 
Onyx PL authorized user or place of usage. The exact meanings of those terms has to be completely understood within the framework. So that dictionary is just as important to the framework as the Onyx PL XML expression itself. So JISC has also created a, another tool called LCAT for comparing licenses so that you a library institution could see the effect of here's the model license, here's what we negotiated, here's the value that that negotiation delivered to us. So um, there are relatively few implementations of Onyx PL, I have to say. It's been around for a few years and there are handfuls, no more than that, of implementations. Because its use is extremely specialised, that library use case. What we're seeing now, though, is a project funded by the Mellon Foundation in the US and being delivered by NISO in the US to encode in this form a very large number of standard publishers' licences so that libraries will be able to customise them uh, more easily in the future rather than starting from scratch. I think that's all I want to say, and uh, I'll welcome questions at the end of the session. Thank you.